In this video, we're going to learn the second method for making cream-based soup. In the first uh, method that we learned, uh, we used a pre-made velouté sauce uh, added into our vegetable base. In this method, um, we're going to sweat our vegetables again, but this time we're going to make the roux uh, and use chicken stock uh, instead of using the pre-made velouté. So to start, we're going to add in our butter, let that melt. And for the recipe today, uh, we're going to make a mushroom, a cream of mushroom soup. Uh, so again, uh, same goes, whereas we could use any sort of vegetable uh, to make this cream soup. Uh, it's the method that we're concerned with. Um, so you could use this for celery or carrot or chicken, uh, you know, whatever you wanted to make uh, as your cream soup. Uh, it's just really focused on the method. So, uh, while the butter is melting, I wanted to talk briefly about uh, using mushrooms. Uh, so, mushrooms um, grow in dirt, uh, and um, as a result, um, a lot of times there's some residual dirt on them. You can actually see here that there's some of this dirt uh, on the outside of this mushroom here. So, to clean this mushroom, we're just going to use a clean kitchen rag and just kind of wipe it off. You can see I'm just going to check the mushroom underneath. Okay, and wipe off any of that dirt. Um, I'm using a dry rag, which works uh, very well. Some people like to use a wet rag, also works well. Some people use paper towels, that's fine too. What you don't want to do is you don't want to wash them underwater. Uh, mushrooms are very porous, uh, and when we wash them underwater, they're going to collect that water. Um, so generally, we're going to use um, just either a, a, a dampened or a dry towel and just wipe that dirt off. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. So my butter is mostly melted. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and add in my sliced mushrooms, my chopped onions. I'm going to go ahead and toss these with my fat. And I'm going to let these sweat for about three minutes uh, just until uh, we get those quality indicators that we're looking for of that uh, slightly cooked color, but excuse me, that slightly cooked appearance, but without adding uh, any of the brown color from uh, our heat being too high. So we'll check back in once we're there. All right, welcome back. It's been about three minutes. Uh, our mushrooms and onions have uh, sweated. Um, one thing I forgot to mention before we um, cut away was I went ahead and added a little bit of salt. So generally when I sweat vegetables, I'm always gonna add uh, just a little pinch of salt to help uh, remove some of that moisture. Uh, so I went ahead and did that um, as we were sweating the vegetables. So again, you can see um, our mushrooms um, have darkened in color uh, a little bit, not because we uh, had our heat too high. Um, they've just um, kind of absorbed some of uh, the liquid, uh, some of that fat. Uh, you can tell they're not really browned. Um, they're just a little uh, wilted color again. Um, our onions have kind of become opaque. So uh, this is how we know our vegetables uh, are sweated appropriately. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to make a white roux right in uh, with our fat and our vegetables. So we're going to go ahead and add our flour. Just mix to combine. Now 
This white roux is going to take a minute or two to cook. Um, the quality indicator we're looking for with white roux is that we no longer smell that raw flour smell. We want to tr start to transition from a raw flour smell to a slightly uh, nutty smell. But we're not really trying to add any color. Just cook off that raw flour taste. All right, so it's been approximately two minutes. Uh, our uh, flour has uh, combined with our fat and we've made a white roux. Uh, when I smell this, uh, I don't have any of that raw flour smell. I'm just starting uh, to get that nutty smell, uh, which is what I want in my roux. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to add our stock to our roux. So what we want to do remove our pot from our heat source. I always like to use a whisk when I'm incorporating liquid into a roux. We're going to add the roux, or excuse me, we're going to add the stock in a steady stream and we're going to whisk vigorously. Uh, the stock has been heated. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and add our hot stock and I'm going to whisk as I add. And I'm going to make sure I really get into all of the corners and across the whole bottom of the pot so that I don't get any lumps. I want to make sure that flour is dispersed throughout my soup here. Nothing left in any of the corners. I'll go back on here. You can see nothing left on any of the corners all the way across the bottom so I don't have any lumps of roux. Okay, so I'm gonna bring this up to a simmer and I'm gonna let this simmer for about 15 or 20 minutes um, until my soup has thickened to a light nappe. When we come back, we're going to uh, puree and strain our soup and then finish with uh, adjusting the seasoning and texture. All right, so it's been about 20 minutes uh, and our soup has uh, been simmering and you can see that uh, our soup has thickened and we're at a really nice uh, kind of thin nappe uh, it is going to thicken a little bit more uh, once we puree our vegetables. So we'll reevaluate uh, once we uh, puree and strain. So to puree this soup, uh, we're going to use an immersion blender. Uh, this is also referred to in industry uh, as a stick mixer or a burr mixer. Uh, uh, sometimes it's called a boat motor, uh, but that's all referring to this uh, immersion blender. So uh, there's going to be two parts. There's going to be the uh, stick end that actually has the, the blender uh, head on it. And then there's the, uh, the base, which has the motor in it. The stick end here uh, is water safe, so we can submerge this for dishwashing. Uh, whereas this, uh, because it has the motor, uh, is generally not going to be uh, able to be submerged. So to clean this, we're just going to wipe it down with a sanitizer solution. All I need to do to connect the stick end with the base uh, is just line it up and click it in. Uh, there is a release on the back, uh, so to release it, all I need to do is hit the release button and it'll pop back out. Okay. So, I'm going to remove my soup from my heat source. To use the immersion blender, all I have to do is put it in the soup and then turn it on. Um, some, a couple things that are going to be important. Um, I don't necessarily want to put my immersion blender straight down on the bottom. What will happen is it will kind of create a vacuum uh, where the big chunks can't uh, rotate in through and come in contact with the blade. So I'm going to want to have the immersion blender kind of at an angle, but I want to make sure it's submerged in my soup. Um, otherwise, if it's not submerged, it's going to have a tendency to splash. If maybe you don't have enough soup in, in the pot or you don't have enough product, um, you can also just tilt your your uh, pan or pot uh, like this and you can see how that gives me uh, more of a base to submerge it into. So I'm going to tilt my pot like this. I'm going to have my immersion blender at an angle while still being submerged and I'm just going to depress the button here and you can see I don't, I can move it around if I want to but really just leaving it in place like this is going to let that soup kind of rotate through.
give it just one more little pulse here. I really want to make sure that all of my uh, mushroom pieces uh, are well pureed through the soup because um, I don't want to waste any of that mushroom by not allowing it to puree. All right, the next step is I'm going to go ahead and strain my soup. Okay. So for this, I'm going to use uh, my fine mesh uh, strainer, my chinois. I'm going to go ahead and pour my soup in. And once again, I'm going to use my rubber spatula just to help work the soup through the strainer. I'm going to use my rubber spatula, scrape down the sides of my chinois, and just help work the soup through my strainer here. All right, so I've pressed most of the liquid out of my puree. You can see I just have a very little small a bit of this kind of gritty mushroom puree left. Uh, everything else has been pressed out through the, uh, the chinois here. I'm gonna go ahead and set this aside. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and add my soup back to my heat, just bring it back up to a simmer, and I'm gonna start evaluating uh, for both texture and flavor. Okay. So you can see I have this real nice light nappe here, just clinging to the back of my spoon. Nice light cream soup, this is exactly what I want. Uh, I don't think I'm actually gonna thin this out. Um, if I did wanna thin this out, um, I could use stock or milk, um, so you see, uh, here I had some milk ready to go to thin this soup out, uh, but I don't think I'm going to need it. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and finish with a little bit of heavy cream. I'm going to add just a little bit of rich mouth feel at the end. Sprinkle of salt and just a little bit of white pepper. Go ahead and incorporate that in. Check taste, uh, gonna check both for seasoning uh, as well as for the mouthfeel. Mm. I might want just a hair more salt in that. Go ahead and do my final taste. And that's perfect. Really nice, rich mushroom flavor with that very, very creamy uh, texture, very smooth mouthfeel. So let's review. When using the cream soup two method, we're gonna begin by sweating our vegetables, then adding flour in with our sweated vegetables and fat to create a white roux, and then add our hot stock in. Next, when thinning a cream-based soup, you can use either milk or stock to thin your soup. Finally, remember, this method can be used with any vegetable that you choose. It doesn't just have to be mushrooms. Try this method with different vegetables like asparagus, uh, spinach, uh, or even peas.